Good evening, my name is Murray Harris. I'm head of KiwiSaver at Milford, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you into another in our KiwiSaver live stream series. By now, hopefully you have uh, relaxed in front of your screens, you've had something to eat, you've got a cup of tea or maybe something a little bit stronger, and you can enjoy the show for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I'm joined on the Milford sofa this evening by our expert panel, who are going to answer your questions for the next 45 minutes. Introducing from my right, Rachel Arbuckle, who's uh, one of our sustainable investment analysts and part of our ESG and sustainable investing team. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Mark Riggle, who's portfolio manager for the balance funds at Milford, both the KiwiSaver and the investment funds balance fund, and also the Milford KiwiSaver moderate fund. Welcome, Good Mark. Man. Ashley Brown, who's a KiwiSaver advisor here at Milford. And last but not least, Felix Fock, who's a portfolio manager for Global Equities. And of course, Global Equities forms an important part of all of our KiwiSaver funds other than the cash fund. So uh, Felix has a very important role in, in, in your KiwiSaver funds. So welcome, thank you for joining me. Um, as we said on the uh, live stream invite, the format for this evening is simply just a question and answer session. We want to answer as many of your questions as we can in the next 45 minutes. Now, we've already had a number of questions come in. Uh, for those of you that registered through the invite on, uh, on the email, and as you've been logging in this evening, uh, you've been asking questions, which is great, great to see. Uh, but also you can ask questions live as we work through this evening's uh, presentation or, 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 or chat. Uh, how do you do that? You'll see on your screens to the right hand side, there's a box, you simply type your question in there and hit send. That'll come through to our team behind the scenes here and they are posting the questions on the screen here for us to answer. Now, we will endeavor to answer as many questions as we can. I don't think we're gonna get through all of them because <laughs> I can see we've got a lot already, uh, but please send them through. And if you are interested in getting a response to a specific question, then please uh, leave us your contact details and we can email back with a, with a response for you in the next 48 hours. Or uh, at any time, of course, you can send a question into uh, our, our team here, the Investor Services team at info at milfordasset.com. Now, uh, as with every investment presentation these days, uh, there is a disclaimer. And this presentation is no different. So the disclaimer this evening is that this presentation is not intended as financial advice. It is information only. If you do need advice, you should speak to a financial advisor. And of course, we have a number of those available at Milford and their disclosure statements are available on request and free of charge. Now, before we get on to the presentation, I thought I'd just give a very brief update on the performance of the Milford KiwiSaver funds uh, over the last year and longer period. Uh, these returns are to the end of April. Of course, we've just finished May. Uh, we'll have the May results out to you in the next few days. But as you can see, the returns for all of the Milford KiwiSaver funds over the last year have been extremely good. Uh, and, and of course, that does reflect the returns we've seen as markets have recovered from the depths of the COVID sell-off. And of course, we were all coming out of uh, lockdown and uh, trying to deal with what this thing, this global pandemic was going to mean uh, for markets, investments, and indeed our lives uh, at this time last year. So I will caution that the one year returns are very, very good uh, and not what we would expect to see uh, going forward, given the rebound we've seen in markets. Uh, the longer term returns, three, five, and 10 years is more what we'd expect. And we're very proud of the consistently good results that we've generated for our KiwiSaver members um, uh, over time. And then just touching briefly on the awards, um, you can see on the slide there, the uh, um, Morningstar Award, we were awarded in February uh, for overall performance across many asset classes, as Morningstar called out there. So very proud of that. Consumer New Zealand Award, we've won that for the last three years in a row. We eagerly await the announcement of this year's awards and CanStar, uh, a couple of very good recognition there for our KiwiSaver funds. So uh, we continue to work very hard for our members to make sure that we continue to give you these very good returns and excellent service. So on with the uh, questions. Uh, so really we've got uh, sort of 40, 40 minutes or so, uh, lots of questions coming in and I'm just gonna pose the questions to our panelists here and they will give you their answer. So ask us a question on anything that you like to do with KiwiSaver, of course. Uh, 
maybe anything in life, but uh, we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, but obviously we've got uh, KiwiSaver advisor here. We've got Rachel from our sustainable investing team, ESG, sustainable investing, and of course a couple of portfolio managers. So I might just uh, start by uh, posing the first question. Uh, I think we'll go to a question from John. Uh, talking about returns over the last five years for the NZX, the New Zealand share market, has returned 13% per annum, excluding dividends. Uh, he says his Milford fund over a similar period, unfortunately he hasn't uh, given us the detail of which fund, but has returned 11.35% after fees and tax. So we would assume that's a growth fund, similar to a, uh, a share market type fund. Uh, which is the better investment? And I'm, I'm going to pose that question to Mark. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for that question. It's a good question. It's always good to look at um, alternative in investments, different ones you can invest in and, and make a decision as to, um, as to what might be the best one looking forward. Of course, all the information the question has given us is about what's happened in the last five years. I think it's worth pointing out that even our growth funds are not the same as a single asset class like New Zealand equities. And what do we mean by that? Well, our growth funds or all of our key research funds are diversified. So they invest in New Zealand equities, but also Australian equities, or even global equities. And because they're diversified, it means they carry a little bit less risk. So um, the growth fund, for example, our active growth KiwiSaver fund, um, has 20% allocation to income or, or cash. So there's only 80% in share. So instantly you can see how over a long period, it will probably deliver slightly less than a, a pure equity index, such as the New Zealand one. And then the second point is that you know, it's not just the return, but it's the risk. It's the journey you've had along the way. So how volatile, you know, when we had the pandemic, you know, in the middle of last year, uh, when we've had previous bouts of volatility in markets, how is that, how are those investments behaving? And our diversified investments will likely suffer less volatility, i.e. fall less than an all equity index like the New Zealand one. Mm. So I guess the key point there really is it's not an apples for apples or like for like comparison when you compare an index to a fund. Yeah. And a fund is going to be more diversified, as you mentioned, exposure to low risk assets like cash and bonds. Yep, that's right. Excellent. And, that, and that is, of course, for KiwiSaver and for other investment funds, is what we're trying to do is manage risk, but, but maximise the return. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so the next question that we have will be from, uh, it's an anonymous question. Could you explain what process you go through when selecting companies to invest in for the active growth fund. Now, I know that's not one of your funds, but again, I'll, I'll pose this question to you, Mark, given uh, your, your asset allocation um, responsibilities across the team, and, and you work closely with Jonathan, who runs the active growth fund. Yeah. So um, well, how I, would you answer that? I, th I think I can start off by saying the active growth fund invests in a, a myriad of asset classes. So New Zealand equities, Australian equities, but also global equity. So I think you know, we've got Felix here. I think it's worthwhile handing over to him to talk yeah. about how he chooses companies that invest um, in his fund, which then go into the active growth fund. So yeah, on that point that Mark just mentioned, uh, the active growth fund invests in global equities through my fund, but also directly. And often mm. the direct ideas, you know, are our best ideas within our fund that's also shared. Uh, which Jonathan Winders, the portfolio manager, also agrees with and therefore allocates more capital to. So when we think about investing in shares, firstly, isn't equities a risk asset class? So you're looking for upside, you're looking for opportunity to see earnings growth, right? Because earnings growth is a very powerful force to ensure that the share prices can rise. So you're looking for situations where the companies is customers are strong and in a favorable spot in the economy, in the economic cycle. So fundamentally, you know, to try and make sure we do get through questions is we ask a very basic question, why should this company exist? What is the job that this company is doing for its customers, be it corporate customers or consumer customers? And from there, we can then figure out who are the competitors in the space, how are the shares priced in terms of valuation compared to the other parts of the market. Uh, and there we can make a judgment as to the risk reward of investing in those shares of those companies. Mm. And with so many different companies and investments that you could be choosing, that's part of the, the strength of the Milford team. It's very broad, it's got a lot of experience yeah. across a number of different markets. And so we can apply that to funds like the Active Growth Fund and selecting the investments. Great, thank you. 
the next question uh, comes from Edgar Wilson. Uh, welcome, uh, th welcome, and Edgar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, when interest rates begin to rise, what effect do you envisage will happen on investment returns, and why? I might pose that one for you, Mark. First, um, that's a great question because interest rates are the building block of all investing, um, so they're the number one consideration. Um, for the last 40 years, interest rates have been falling, uh, and that's been a really good tailwind for, for investing because over that period, um, the cost of capital has fallen, the discount rate has fallen, so um, the value of future cash flows is worth more today, so valuations of companies are allowed to rise. Um, so, so that falling interest rate environment has been a great tailwind to invest in. Now, of course, though, potentially we might see that turn, um, and we are wary of that um, as a potential headwind um, for um, share markets and other asset classes. Mm -hmm. um, so we're bearing that in mind. Uh, we are taking a number of steps. Um, there's not going to, you know, if interest rates do rise, it won't impact all asset classes in the same way. So, for example, we can reduce our exposure to bonds, which are directly impacted by interest rates. Um, and we can, on the equity side, on the share side, invest in companies which might not be so negatively impacted by rising interest rates. An example of that would be like a bank which benefits from rising long-term interest rates. So there's lots of things we can do, lots of flexibility in the funds to try and mitigate against the risk of rising interest rates. Mm -hmm. So it's not potentially not the risk that you might see if, it, if you were just exposed to one type of bond or a term deposit. That's right. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Anonymous. What happens if you are 65 and keep working? Do you still get the government top up and does your employer still have to pay their 3%? Uh, actually, question from Stuart. Uh, so that's a Kiwi server question. We'll pose that one to you, Ashley. Yes, yeah, so the government contribution does stop at the age of 65. Um, with the employer, and that stops regardless of whether or not you continue to work, with employer contributions, your employer's obligation is to stop at the age of 65, but some employers will keep contributing. Mm. So I would suggest checking in with your employer or payroll team just to see whether or not they will continue to pay mm. past 65. Mm. Well, it's a fantastic benefit if, uh, if your employer does want to continue to pay that. Yeah. So all adds up. And, uh, and while we're on the subject of KiwiSaver, we've got another question from Stuart. Uh, what's the best method for me to increase my personal contribution to my KiwiSaver? There's two different ways. So employee contributions, if you're employed, you can increase if you're currently on 3% to 4, 6, 8 or 10. And you can do that through your employer or through your payroll team. Um, or you can set up voluntary contributions. So you can do that through online banking or a direct debit. Um, and to learn how to do that, you can log into the Milford Client Portal or mobile app, look at the Payments and Transactions tab, um, and it'll give you information on how to make payments into your KiwiSaver account and a specific reference details to allocate it to your KiwiSaver. Mm. So it's very easy and, and all available to do online or talk to your, your payroll people. That's right, yeah. Good. Uh, a question from Esther. Can you split your KiwiSaver funds, like have 50% in a growth fund and the other 50% in an aggressive fund? Well, that's yes, another question you for can. you, Ashley. Yes, that's you very so easy. You, you can invest in, in one of the KiwiSaver funds, or you can split it over a number of the KiwiSaver funds that we have available. Um, the functionality to do that is through the client portal or Milford mobile app. So you just log in and you can switch funds and allocate 50% to one and 50% to another. Or, or less, any amount. Or less, any amount. Yep. Um, but if you are wondering whether or not you are in the right fund, I would suggest um, to either clients that are currently with Milford or those that aren't, to go through our Milford KiwiSaver digital advice tool. Mm. That tool will provide a recommendation of which Milford KiwiSaver fund's suitable, um, and then they can go through and switch funds through, mm. through that um, digital tool as well. Yeah, and that's a good point. I, and uh, for those of you watching on the live stream, you'll see the videos at the bottom of your screen. There is a video there about our digital advice tools. So have a quick look at that. It's a short video. It tells you how to use those advice tools and the benefits that you might have by doing that. Um, and whether you're an existing Milford KiwiSaver member, you can use those tools. Or for those of you that have joined us that are prospective Milford KiwiSaver members or you're checking us out, uh, go and have a look at that because that's a really powerful tool to see how you can get on track for your KiwiSaver and then be able to achieve your retirement goals. Okay, um, 
Another question from Anonymous. I've checked out Milford's performance re-ethical investing on mindful money. What are Milford's goals in this area? So um, I'm going to pose that question to Rachel, but before I do that, Rachel is part of our sustainable investment team and a sustainable investing analyst. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about what that means? I mean, there's been a lot of talk and we see a lot of media around ESG, sustainable <coughs> investing. There's a lot of acronyms. Yeah. What does that mean at Milford? What do we do to make sure we're making good investment decisions for our members? Yeah, um, great, great question. So um, at Milford, we, um, as an active manager, we integrate ESG considerations into every single investment decision we make. So ESG stands for Environmental Social Governance. So you'll hear us saying that acronym. There's a lot of acronyms in the space. Um, now we do this because we've Milford has always looked for the best companies and we recognise that the best companies are those that are integrating um, a risk analysis on um, whether they're exposed to um, certain environmental risks like climate change or social, um, perhaps to social harm. And so companies that are managing any risk exposure they have or they're um, taking advantage of any ESG tailwinds, um, those are the companies that we want to own. So um, we, yeah, every single investment decision we integrate, um, we look at ESG factors as part of that. So my role is to work with the analysts um, in their coverage of every company um, and make sure that we're across all the different risks and opportunities that, that um, they face. Mm. Um, so in regards to the question that was asked, um, I'll touch on mindful money in a second, but um, our goal, well, what I see is the sustainable investment goals going ahead for the year. Um, I want to increase our engagement program, so um, engage with a, a wider range of companies on a wider range of um, ESG issues. So for example, a lot of our focus so far has been on emissions um, reporting from companies, um, but increasingly we're pushing um, more on the social side, so um, making sure companies are across their supply chains, for example, or through COVID, how how companies treated their employees through COVID. Um, mindful Money is a really great tool um, to bring awareness to these issues that New Zealanders really care about. Um, the only thing it doesn't do, it doesn't reflect in every um, individual fund manager's approach. So the best thing to do is if you, you know, go onto Mindful Money, check it out, and then it's come and website, talk to right? us about so it, correct? Dub, 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 mindful Money, yep. code on NZ. Yeah, yep. yep. and it's fabulous. Um, but yeah, do make sure you come and talk to us about that. Um, because yeah, there will be um, certain exposures we have to um, some risk areas, but but we've balanced that risk exposure with um, you know we, we think okay well the the company's managing that risk really well and so we're still happy to be involved in it because it mm. gives us exposure to the industry more generally. Mm. And there are some industries that we absolutely won't invest in. So maybe just give us a couple of examples of those. Yep, correct. So um, we won't invest in tobacco manufacturers. Um, any a broad range of weaponry, so um, things like anti-personnel mines, um, cluster munitions, or um, since the Christchurch um, attack, um, mm. civilian firearms, um, semi-automatic and automatic firearms, um, and then um, the processing of whale meat is another one. So um, beyond that, even though even though the, yeah those are hard exclusions, we have no exposure to them. Um, beyond that, we yeah every single um, investment we're looking at, we incorporate the the risk analysis into that. So mm. essentially ESG integration is a um, very considered um, management of those risks that, yep. that come up. Thank you. And, and the great thing about KiwiSaver is that we've got so many people engaged in investing that weren't in the past mm -hmm. and they bring their values to that and they want their money to be doing well and invested in good companies. So yep. it's become a very, very topical issue for all investment managers and it's something that we take very, very seriously. Yeah, I like I like getting the emails. I like, I yeah. like the engagement. Yeah, keep yeah. asking That's me great. the questions. Yep. Great. A uh, question from Aaron. Uh, what are some of the indicators that Milford use when determining risk exposure? Milford seem to be very good at adjusting exposure to the market. Um, probably one for you, Mark, yeah. first. And if you've got anything to add as well, Felix. But it's a, it's a great yeah. question. Um, yeah, I mean, the equity or the share market in particular is, is a bit like a manic depressive. You know, it gets very, very excited mm -hmm. at times and, and at other times it's very despondent. And, you know, and, and everyone tends to act in the same way at the same time, um, you know, getting excited or, or despondent. So our, our job is to try and identify when those times happen and, and not get too carried away on at either end. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a framework that we've developed to try and help us navigate that. 
Um, and boiling it down, there's um, three particular elements to it. So, val uh, uh, the valuation of shares is, you know, ultimately you have to be aware of the, you know, what the current value is versus long run um, estimates or versus other asset classes. So, our shares broadly expensive or cheap. Um, what's the positioning? And, and by that I mean, what's the sentiment like? And there's lots of surveys out there which take the temperature of how people feel about share markets. And you see these, you know, become very bullish or, or very bearish at different points in time. So, look, if valuations are expensive and everyone's really bullish, then hang on, we'll just start to flash some more warning signals. Mm. Um, and then the, the, the third bit, which is actually a really important bit, is what's the catalyst? What's going to cause people to change their mind? everyone to collectively wake up and you see this happen, you know, it happened last year during COVID, right? At the beginning of the year, everyone was really bullish. Valuations were expensive. COVID came along and everyone ignored it for the first couple of months. Market kept making new highs. Mm. Um, using, our, using our framework, we thought, okay, well, everything's in place. The catalyst is COVID. Let's take some money off the table. So that's the framework we had. And that's an example of, of how we applied it at that time. Mm. Mm. Great. And of course, with technology and with COVID and the lockdown, the DIY investing platforms became very, very popular and we've seen real growth in those across the globe and in New Zealand. But of course, uh, I guess the difference between what you can do yourself at home by picking a few shares and what we do as investment professionals is that risk management. Mm. Um, I guess anyone can pick half a dozen companies that might look good, but can you actually manage the risk? And I guess that's a, it's a key difference between what we do and, and what a DIY investor might do. Yep. Hey, great questions. Uh, keep them coming. Thank you very much. Um, and look, we want to keep the questions rolling because we're going to do a prize draw. Uh, we've got some wonderful prize packs here from the Milford uh, merchandising cupboard. Uh, a Milford beanie, which I uh, might give to Mark to wear home tonight because it's quite cold <laughs> out there. Uh, so everyone on the ski slopes this year or mm. out in the cold weather as we uh, it's the first day of winter today isn't it uh milford beanie it could be very very useful and uh milford kiwi saver umbrella and these are the blunt brand umbrellas uh with the milford logo so if you want to be in a prize draw for one of those keep sending your questions in we've got 10 of those to give away as a pack um, and at the end there will be a survey uh, we want your feedback so we'll we'll give out some of those for uh, those that leave their details for the survey as well at the end uh, and of course yeah, you will need to leave us your contact details if you do want to be in the draw for those so we can send it out to you um, so let's keep the questions going another question from Andrew hi guys uh, one of your selling points has been how nimble you are with your increasing client base do you think you are becoming less nimble and I guess really that's positioned more about um, the funds under management and some of the funds getting larger that our active investment style may be impinged by the ability to move as nimbly as we we could do in the past mm. so maybe you yeah, mark I, first and I think I can exactly yes I'll start that one off and then I might yeah. hand over to Felix for some, for some mm. good examples because I mean undoubtedly um, you know we are getting bigger and struggling in New Zealand to um, invest mm. in um, in companies because the amount of money we need to invest to have a meaningful position you know becomes too large for the market that we're in so what we've done is we've tried to open up other channels where we can be confident in investing and Australia's you know the initial example of that and we consider that to be a home market for us but more recently it's been in the global space where we've been investing a lot so maybe Felix if you want to talk about our investment in, in your team and, and what that's meant for performance yes yeah, so in global equities there are now five of us three senior PMs um, portfolio managers uh, supported by two analysts and in our Sydney office, we have two other colleagues which are just focused on global infrastructure companies. So that's already, if you like, seven dedicated global orientated uh, investment professionals. And obviously, we have the wider investment team as well, not only Mark, Jonathan Winders, as I mentioned, the portfolio manager of the Active Growth Fund, but also our fixed income team and our Australian colleagues. So we really have been building our capabilities and building touch points to just see what's going on in the world because there's a lot going on out there beyond the shores of New Zealand and certainly for the investment space as well. And the more capabilities and more conviction we have in being good at investing in Australia, in the US, Europe and Asia, the more nimbleness we'll be able to retain. Mm. And I know that we've added six people to the investment team over the last two years, and they are in roles where we're able to diversify our investment strategy and, and yeah. look further afield than New Zealand and Australia, where you are constrained. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
All right, a question from Philip. Uh, is tech a focus for the future uh, for the future investments? And if so, what direction would that take? I think that's probably a question for you, Felix, given the global technology companies and investments that yeah. we've made. So in the Global Equities Fund, we, we do have an overexposure. We, we like technology companies uh, as a fundamental prospect because ultimately investing requires whatever you're investing in to be valuable at a future date. So, you know, technology companies, the basis of it is they spend money on research and they're trying to have a better solution for either an existing problem or solving future problems. And that's fundamentally exciting. Uh, and it goes part and parcel with, you know, where we tend to focus our time. You know, as investment professionals, there are probably 10 things on our plate, on our desk mm -hmm. every day, right? And, and we naturally, as human beings, gravitate towards what interests us, you know, individually the most. Uh, and that's definitely true. So we're very interested in the world of tomorrow and how we get there and who's going to be important. So absolutely, without a doubt, uh, we're keeping our eyes open for, for new solutions or, you know, solving new problems, including you know, some of the climate change problems. And uh, not mm. to say that we just buy those companies because they solve climate change problems, it's because technology is fundamental to solving all of our problems. Mm. Well, actually, while we're on that theme of, of climate change and technology solving those problems, uh, very timely. Next question from Alex. Where do you see industries that support manufacture EVs, so electric vehicles, uh, going, and how do you think it will impact investments? So traditionally, car makers have been a big part of the industrial economy. Uh, you go back to the Model T Ford of the 1920s, 30s, right? That pulled a lot of industry and consumption, rubber, glass, metal, uh, and obviously, you know, petrochemicals as well as, you know, the, the road usage of cars. Now, as we transition towards electric vehicle, which I think everyone would agree is inevitable and is definitely on the cards, some of that's going to hurt some of the existing companies, frankly. Mm. Uh, and what electric vehicles sort of draw on a little bit more than the previous version of the car is certainly semiconductors, which my colleagues have spent a little bit of time, if you've followed our recent road shows, on discussing why we like that space. And it's part and parcel to electrifying the drivetrain, right? So with control power uh, and also at some point, potentially autonomous vehicle, right? Where the vehicle itself can sense the surroundings and drive itself. So we definitely think that that is uh, something that's interesting and we're looking into it. At the moment, we're just playing it relatively broad without mm. picking a specific car manufacturer. Perhaps people think naturally to Tesla. So mm. we haven't done that because we think it's very, very difficult to determine which of the car makers could, could come out in front. Uh, but we've been broad based in our approach and we're exposed to that area, certainly. Mm. Mm. Um, oh, sorry. Can I just sure, add to sure, that? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah from, a, from a, I guess, a broader view, um, we are very aware of this low carbon, this transition to a low carbon yeah. economy happening. Um, and electric vehicles certainly will make up a part of that. Um, for Milford, we are um, restricted in terms of um, we can't invest in very, very small companies. So we have, you know, we've got a certain market cap we have to invest in. And a lot of these new um, low carbon technologies that are coming online are um, in these, you know, quite small companies. Mm. So we have to try access it in other ways. Um, so yeah, Tesla is a, is a great example, but there's not a lot of other, you know, the big industrial makers are slowly bringing more EV capacity on board. Mm. Um, but yeah, we're very aware that the transition is happening and, and we're looking for opportunities to be part of that and involved in that and benefit from that. Mm. And you mentioned semiconductors, which uh, are all around us everywhere every day and we don't know it yeah. Yeah. our phones have got more power than powered the apollo 11 to the moon yeah. that's right so somebody told me recently <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh well let's keep that sustainable theme going rachel mm -hmm. with a question from peter sustainable investments what benchmarks are used in assessing one company over another and especially when companies report and measure their own sustainability differently and this is something we're seeing now mm listed companies it's just a ticket to the game is they need to be telling us what they're doing from a sustainability point of view yeah absolutely great question peter um so the um we 
the checklist that we run every single investment through considers um, environmental um, considerations, social um, aspects as well as governance, and then also um, an extra part of that is how much a company is disclosing or not. So disclosure is very, very important, um, and that is something we push with every company that we talk to. If companies are not disclosing, either it means they're not measuring it, which they should be, frankly, um, or they're measuring it and it's not looking that good, so they're not wanting to disclose mm. it. So um, disclosure is very important. Um, we're continuing to push for that more and it is absolutely something that feeds in. Um, it's not a final, you know, it's not a binary. Um, so if companies aren't disclosing it, then we'll be going to talk to them to understand um, what they're doing about it and what their strategies are. Mm. But that's definitely a um, big factor we look mm. at. And, and the old saying goes, what gets measured gets done. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And so we're looking for that. Mm. Yeah. Great. Uh, Julie, question from Julie. Mary Holmes suggested investing with the lowest fee provider. What is your view on that? I might give that one to you, Ashley, and, um, and yeah, I can sure. maybe yeah. answer that <laughs> as well. But, uh, so fees, fees aren't the only thing that you should be focusing on when looking at a KiwiSaver provider. There are a number of factors. Fees definitely is one, so you need to factor in how much fees you are playing with in your KiwiSaver account. You also want to be looking at the returns that your KiwiSaver provider is able or has provided in recent years, um, focusing on long-term returns, so those five-year returns and 10-year returns. Also, what types of services does that pro provider give you? Mm. So with Milford, if you're looking at what Milford would provide KiwiSaver clients, uh, we provide access to advice. So you need to see whether or not, or do a comparison to see whether that lower fee provider provides advice. If they've got um, a mobile app or client portal where you've got transparency over your account and you can check in. Um, and what tools are available? So we've got a range of online tools, like you mentioned earlier, Forecast My Balance, to see what your balance could look like at the age of 65 and how that could have an impact on the KiwiSaver income you could have in retirement. Also, Spend My KiwiSaver, which is available to members over the age of 65, mm. just so they can grasp what their retirement income could look like as well. So those are the three things that I'd focus on, fees, services, and investment returns. Mm. That's a good summary. Well, that's worth us adding on that. You know, sure. We all eat our own cooking, right? We're all invested in the very same funds that, that our clients are in. We believe in active management. We believe we can deliver greater returns than, than you know, typically passive or low fee um, yep. type investors. Hence, we're invested in our own funds and, 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 and enjoying the returns despite paying the fees as well. So, mm. so I think you know, we, we believe in it. We think it can continue to, um, to deliver better returns and better service mm. to clients. Um, despite the high fee. Yeah, and I, I guess philosophically, we're, we're, we're quite opposed to where Mary comes from. She's a fan of passive, and passive generally is low cost, as it should be, because mm. there's no active investment management. Mm. Our strategy and our philosophy is all driven around, as active managers, we can make a difference. We can generate better long-term returns. Mm. And, and of course, you know, we should point out that all of the, and Kiwi, this is where KiwiSaver is really good again, all of the fees, uh, uh, sorry, the returns that are produced through the Morningstar surveys and various other um, publications are after fees. So when you're comparing providers, you really need to look at that on an after fee basis and, and KiwiSaver is very good for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we said, we're very proud of our, of our active uh, investment management track record. I guess um, there has been a few other questions come through in terms of themes around fees. Uh, one of those is, you know, are we looking at our own fees uh, and are we looking to review them? And the answer to that is yes, we constantly look at our fees to make sure that they're appropriate. Uh, we know the regulator, the FMA, have recently been vocal around this and provided guidance around value for money in KiwiSaver. It's something that we take very seriously as well. So I guess on the, other than the investment management fees where our fees are middle of the pack, we would say, so around about the average for the investment management fees versus our active peers. So we're comfortable with where they sit. Ashley's already touched on what you get for those fees in terms of active management track record, but also the other services, access to advice, etc. But the other component of fees for KiwiSaver is the member fee. Uh, and over the last 18 months, we've uh, reduced our member fee. In fact, for under 21s, we've reduced it down to zero. So any members under age 21 with Milford don't pay the member fee, uh, which was $36 a year. And last year, we also remove that fee for any members over age 65 because of course you can stay in KiwiSaver past the age 65. Uh, so we've removed the member fee for those members. And then in January this year, 
in fact for all other members between age 21 and 65 we've halved that uh, member fee to $18 per annum uh, which puts us well below the average member fee across the KiwiSaver industry which is around $25 uh, per annum. So yes it is an area that we're constantly looking at and you know where we can through scale and growth of KiwiSaver as, a, uh, as an industry and for us as a business we can pass those back to our members uh, then we will do that. If I may add and try to tie two strands that have come through, one is ESG or sustainable investing, which for us is an integrated approach that requires resources, it requires engagement and understanding of the nuance of what a company is actually doing. That is very much an active style. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have passive, which you know have simple exclusions, but that's about it. The mm. rest of the world, let's assume, is fine, which clearly is not. Mm. So if we want to take sustainable investing and long-term investing seriously, that is fundamentally an active bias approach. Mm. That's, a, and that's a very good point. And as stewards of capital for our members, we want to make sure that we're influencing those companies mm. that we're investing in to do good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good that's point. Good. Thanks, yeah. Felix. Okay, uh, another question. <laughs> I'm going to pose this one to you, Felix, because it is a uh, topic du jour. Uh, we see a lot of it uh, in the media and in the press. It's cryptocurrency. Uh, mm -hmm. Will we have access to a KiwiSaver fund that has exposure to cryptocurrency in the near future? So we've done work in this space, particularly around Bitcoin, which is the, the notable leading cryptocurrency. Uh, senior members of the team have been, you know, brought up to speed and been given the facts and educated but we take investing of your money very seriously and suffice to say there are still unknowns and question marks out there even though it's been 12 years since the the start of bitcoin for example mm -hmm. uh, we're aware that uh, cryptocurrencies like bitcoin are evolving uh, there are very smart people working on these projects no doubt because I did the work, I appreciated some of the thoughts and the concepts they've been talking about. It's, it's really up there, high class. So not to be dismissed. Very intriguing, very interesting uh, from my personal sort of interest standpoint, because we, we talk about technology. It feels like it's part of the future. But at this point, you know, Milford has not invested in cryptocurrencies, but we continue to monitor. Mm. Um, I'll add to that yeah, sure. if I can. Um, yeah. Cryptocurrency, this is a really good example of ESG integration because cryptocurrencies are incredibly emissions intensive because you have these huge banks of mm. computers mining the, the data. And so that takes a lot of um, power and a lot of emissions because a lot of them are overseas where they don't have as much renewable electricity as we do in New Zealand. So when we go to look at investing in cryptocurrency, the um, large emissions profile will be a risk that we consider and, and weigh up um, against all the other opportunities or risks that cryptocurrency mm. gives us. Mm. And you've recently seen Elon Musk being vocal about this, mm. and the fact yeah, that he yeah. was not going to accept cryptocurrency for payment because of the impact on the environment. Yeah, and there's a green one that's come out, but it's not quite taken taken mm. off yet. Mm. And that still has some emissions associated with it, so it's mm. yeah another risk we'd look at. Anything you'd add, Mark? I mean, cryptocurrency has been incredibly volatile, so difficult asset class yeah. to really consider in a, in a diversified portfolio. That's right. I mean... Um, there's, lots of us, there's lots of asset classes out there right, that we could invest into, which we choose not to. Mm. Um, partly because we don't have any expertise in that asset class, um, and partly because when we assess the attributes of the asset class, it may not fit particularly well within even a diversified portfolio. Um, crypto, you know, is, is still quite nascent, and, um, and I think what we're trying to grasp with is how do you come up with an investment framework around which you could choose how to position size and manage the asset class or to position within the asset class, i.e. which crypto coins do you then go and purchase? So mm. that's work in progress. You know, if we you know, get more confidence in that, then, then that's to say you know, at some point in the future we could uh, integrate it into one of our diversified funds. Mm. Mm. And a wise man once said, in a gold rush, sell shovels. Don't be out there mining the gold. Um, Felix, I mean, we are benefiting from this cryptocurrency boom, though, through other investments, through our exchange exposure. Uh, yep. You mentioned semiconductors, some of our other global investments. Do you want to just touch on that? So, yeah, there are three, three examples. One is PayPal in the US, which uh, is an internet wallet. You can have a PayPal app on your phone and you can pay others or pay merchants with your PayPal. So PayPal last year switched on a function that would allow US users of PayPal to buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrencies, or Bitcoin specifically, in its wallets. So that has had some traction. 
they're not the only wallet provider offering it, but in essence, it's, it's bringing PayPal, so if you like, future-proofing PayPal just in case Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies really become a, a store of value and everyone has you know, some of that lying around. Uh, the other example, exchanges. So we have an exchange um, in inter inter intercontinental exchange in the U.S., ICE, uh, mm -hmm. and they own a subsidiary called BAT, uh, and that is providing uh, futures trading and options. Uh, and the last one is, going back to the semiconductor's point, a lot of cryptocurrency mining uh, are based on specific specialized hardware, uh, and the company Taiwan Semiconductor helps manufacture some of these very specific mining chips. Great, thank you. Good insights. Um, okay, a question from Jeremy. With an extremely heated property market in New Zealand at the moment, does Milford intend on reducing exposure in this sector? Or do you have confidence that there will be continued growth? I guess the, that's one for you, Mark. Yeah, lots of interest always in property in New Zealand, of course. We, we don't invest directly into, mm. into housing um, stocks. We do, um, we do have stocks that offer a proxy for the New Zealand housing market, and that's the retirement sector, mm. like Somerset or, um, or Ryman, that offer those healthcare villages. Um, and so they are um, tied to a certain extent to the fortunes of the New Zealand housing market. And, um, and for that reason, you know, and the very fact that the outlook for New Zealand housing is probably less strong going forward than it has been, um, mm. not least because um, tightening conditions for, for mortgages with potential rising rates you know, from the RBNZ predicted itself um, this time next year, um, means that, yeah, the outlook for housing itself is probably going to be more moderate. Mm. So we have reduced a little bit of our, um, of our exposure into the, into the housing market. Um, stocks like um, like Somerset and uh, and Ryman now, but because they're not exactly tied, there's always a bit of a range around it. So we, you know we we do kind of finesse those positions. Mm. It's not all wholesale, you know, out and in. <laughs> mm. um, but yeah, we are reduced. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be an investment presentation or discussion without a question about New Zealand house prices. <laughs> um, Question from Kevin. Uh, we might come back to Ashley on this with uh, KiwiSaver. Upon retirement age, instead of taking a lump sum, can I convert my KiwiSaver total into a regular payment, say $1,000 a month, plus take out a small lump sum as required? Yes, you can. So from the age of 65, you can set up a regular either monthly quarterly annual withdrawal amount um, and that can be ongoing then you can also take out withdrawals lump sum amounts when and as you need them um, but I mentioned before that we have that spend my KiwiSaver mm. tool so if you're wanting to get an idea of how much you can withdraw each month or each year throughout your retirement up to your life expectancy age jump into the tool um, and then we'll be able to provide you with a projection through that tool then you can also set up the with, uh, automatic withdrawals um, regularly, fortnightly, mm. monthly, quarterly or annually. And that spend my KiwiSaver tools for people that are approaching 65, so they're already 64? They can only access the tool after the age of 65. So once you're 65, we'll give you accessibility within the client portal or mobile app, mm. and then you can go in and use the projection. Yep. And prior to that, they could use the forecast my balance tool they to can. get an idea but can, without yes. setting up the payment. So up to 65 you can use forecast my balance and that will factor in any contributions that you're making up to the age of 65 and then provide you with that projection or how your KiwiSafe is going to look mm. throughout retirement up to your life expectancy age. Mm. And that's all available online? That's right, yes. And I guess any other questions around that, we've got the uh, um, frequently asked questions an insights page on the, our website where those questions could be answered as well. Yes, that's right. Great, thank you. A uh, question from Roger, so we keep, we'll, we'll keep the, uh, the retirement theme going. For people approaching retirement age, which fund do you recommend transferring to, especially when the funds will not be required for some time? Yeah. Unfortunately, Roger, we don't have a, a one one fits all answer for this one, but um, it comes down to how long is your investment time frame? You don't need, you've mentioned that you might not need your money now, but when will you need to start withdrawing? So investment time frame is a factor. Mm. Also, what's your tolerance to risk? What's your willingness to accept fluctuations during that period? And with those two factors, we'll be able to help determine which fund might be suitable. So it might be that, Roger, you could get in touch with us and we can talk you through the different funds that are available and see what's suitable for you at this point in time. Mm. Great, thank you. 
Well, uh, we've we've really run out of time, uh, and, and I, I got a feeling we we could keep going. I'm sure we've got lots more questions. And look, if we didn't get to your specific question, we apologise. Uh, we could keep this going for a couple of hours, and maybe that's an idea for next time if anyone wants to sit around and till nine o'clock in the evening uh, listening to us answer your questions. But as I said earlier, if we didn't get to your specific question and you do want an answer, either well, uh, now the live stream's finished. Um, if you didn't include your contact details on your question, send your question through to info at milfordasset.com and we can get back to you within the next 48 hours. Of course, the team are always available um, through that email address or through our online, uh, uh, through our 0800 number. Now we've got the umbrellas to give away, so we will choose those, the umbrella and beanie packs. We'll uh, select 10 of you to receive those uh, who answered the, uh, who posted a question uh, and we'll be in touch with you to get those out to you uh, and I mentioned before we've also got some umbrellas and beanies to give away if you'd like to give us your feedback so you'll see on the right hand side of the uh, live stream page there's a button to give us your feedback if you click on that half a dozen very quick questions take you one or two minutes and you can also uh, be walking down the street with one of these very very good Milford umbrellas uh, keeping you dry and a beanie to keep you warm so uh, thank you to our panel, Rachel, Mark, Ashley, and Felix. Uh, thank you to you, our viewers, for joining us. Uh, we hope y you've enjoyed the presentation, watching it as much as we did bringing it to you. Uh, and I guess just in closing, uh, and Mark touched on it, uh, you know, our alignment of interest at Milford is something we take really seriously. We're a staff-owned business, and we're invested in the same funds as you. So we're on the same journey. Uh, we feel the ups and downs with you as well. And we think that's really important. And for that, we really appreciate you entrusting your KiwiSaver with Milford. If you're checking us out for the first time, hope you've enjoyed what you've seen. We do these regularly. We will be doing more of them. Uh, and if you need more information or if you'd like to speak to Ashley or one of the other advisors here, uh, get in touch through the website. We'd be happy to help you. So thank you for joining us. Good night and stay safe. Mm -hmm.